Well, my definition of hope is uh, tied to perseverance. So if someone's willing to persevere in the face of adversity, he's basically driven by this force that we call hope. This ability to persevere with the hope that you would come out on top and survive uh, is what, you know, for me defines hope. My name is Umar Seth and I share hope all the way from Pakistan. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. Umar Seth, you are one of the world's, I would say, leading entrepreneurial thinkers and and innovators. And I've I've been involved in that space for quite a bit of time personally as an entrepreneur here in the States and as a, um, a mentor through an organization called StartCo, where we do a lot of incubator work as well for startups from the States and a few from overseas. But what you're doing is way past that. So your education is unbelievable. I'd love to hear stories about your time. I went to Harvard for a very short course, uh, and I'm, I'm hesitant to even call myself an alum of Harvard, but I was there for about 10 odd days for a course on global policy, which was an extortionist and expensive summer. I worked at MIT for a good four years, and before that, I did my grad school at University of Cambridge in England. Wow. Wow. That's impressive. And then you're really involved in Pakistan. So you're in Pakistan now. Where are you at in Pakistan? I live in Lahore, uh, which is uh, a, a sort of a very historic, a traditional city uh, in Pakistan. It's also one of the largest. It's the capital uh, of the province of Punjab. Punjab is the largest province in Pakistan. About 60% of the people in Pakistan live in Punjab. Uh, and if Punjab was a country, which is this province, it would be the ninth largest in the world by population. Really? Wow. And, and as you know, Pakistan is the sixth most populous country in the world. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So, Umar, you're, you're known for a computer scientist, for being a computer scientist and an entrepreneur. And you need to explain this because I don't understand this, and maybe I won't even have to explain it. I wouldn't be surprised at that. But you're known for your work using ICT. Explain what that means. So ICT stands for Information and Communication Technology. That's basically Internet and Computers. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, most of the time that I, you know, in the last few years I spent uh, trying to solve uh, uh, local problems of Pakistan and in general the developing world uh, using uh, interesting IT solutions. Uh, as it, uh, you know, sort of, as it happens, uh, most of the products, IT products that get designed, and my favorite example is that of an iPhone, uh, are designed for markets uh, that are fundamentally different than, uh, you know, the, the, the physical realities, the economic realities, the social realities of countries like Pakistan and in general the developing world. So, for instance, the iPhone 5 is designed for a market where people are tech savvy, want to install applications, uh, and, and use it as a full-blown entertainment device. Uh, whereas the top three uses of a device like a cell phone in Pakistan is that to give what is called a missed call, which is calling people to let them know that they must call you back because you don't have enough money to make a full phone call, is to use the cell phone as a torch because of all the electricity outages, etc., and to use the cell phone as an FM radio because that's the sole source of entertainment. And the iPhone or the or the or the new exciting new greatest and the latest Android phones are not really designed for that. You can torture that device to do all three things. You could turn on the flash such that it starts to look like a torch. You could use it as an FM radio by inserting headphones in it, etc. Uh, but that's not the functionality that that device is is designed to perform. So therefore, most of the world that I do is in figuring out solutions to very local problems of the developing world. That's surprising to me. So the um, the flashlight, the FM radio, and then the the call and hang up to just let somebody know to call you back on their own dime or their own their own penny, their own cent, their own whatever currency you want to use. So the the flashlight makes sense. The FM radio, that's interesting to me. 
um, so most programming in these developing countries comes still over the radio waves, not via connection to a cell phone tower or internet. Is that correct? Well, so internet is very patchy, and one would expect that, even though you know the mobile internet, the availability of mobile internet would, would change this parity a little bit. And there's obviously television, there's terrestrial television, but people who are on the go and own a cell phone, you know, for them, the FM radio in the cell phone is a major entertainment pull to invest in, a, in this technology. They're basically using it to make missed calls, which is to ask people to call them back and to use it to listen to songs that they like on FM radio. And that's essentially, you know, how all these cell phones are used. Now, obviously, there's no cell phone in the world that's designed for those two purposes. You know, there's some products that are designed for the developing world, hence have those features. But no one in the world is kind of thinking about designing products for just that. So that's just, that's just sort of an extreme example in the spectrum. But I think there are lots of interesting products, solutions, and a lot of research that needs to be done in how technology is used in the developing world. I love it. Wow. That's creative and extremely, extremely engaging. And then there's so many people who are just tapping that market now for for an entrepreneur like yourself and for so many other people who'd love to back projects financially. I would think there's there's a lot of investment opportunity there um, if if you get the right Absolutely. information behind the right product. Is that correct? Yes. Absolutely. I think... Uh, uh, there will be, you know, the, the Google's waiting to happen, the Google scale companies waiting to happen from economies, countries like Pakistan, you know, between Indonesia and Pakistan and Philippines, etc. You have one of the largest markets for cell phones, for instance. Pakistan is the ninth largest market for cell phones anywhere in the world. We have 135 million cell phone users in this country. We are also one of the largest uh, texting countries in the world. Uh, Pakistan is the, the text arena that they use the phone to also send texts text to each other. I think they sent about 253 billion SMSs just last year as of, you know, published figures. Wow. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity, you know, for monetizing the use of technology in this part of the world. So a program like this, I sure hope we, we record it and then we release it on an MP3 file um, via podcast typically, but we have a, a direct MP3 file download link on our website. Is is that something that the average cell phone user or average person in Pakistan could actually get a hold of? Or is that type of file or media not really accessible? Well, I think media is accessible, uh, but the bandwidth, etc., is not such that you know you could use streaming video any of that uh, you know in real time. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, sir, let me ask you these questions about hope. So here's here's how we do this for anybody who hasn't already heard the background. We're interviewing a thousand leaders of hope around the world. What that means, practically speaking, an easier way to think about that is every. 8 million people on the planet would get one representative on the survey. That's how the, how the numbers break down. So this is an amazing opportunity because we're, we're talking into Pakistan, which has a very different view of the world than other places. Each person we talk to is so different and comes from such a different background. And yet there's these common themes of hope that seem to connect humanity all over the globe. So, Umar, I really appreciate your time. Question number one is, what is your definition of hope or your favorite quote about hope? Well, my definition of hope is uh, tied to perseverance. So if someone's willing to persevere in the face of adversity, he's basically driven by this force that we call hope. And my favorite thing to say about hope is this little incident that I was told in college by a professor where he explained an experiment, I think done on frogs or mice or, 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 or you know, it was a laboratory experiment where they put frogs in water for several hours and the frogs had to swim, swim to stay afloat and to stay alive. At the end of that experiment, uh, you know, they allowed some of these frogs to drown and the rest were rescued and put into another jar. And that same experiment was repeated again. The ones that got saved, because they had hoped that they could live, in the next experiment swam for much longer, actually 10 times longer, in the hope that they would survive again. Whereas the ones that were new to the experiment gave up much more quickly. So I think this ability to persevere with the hope that you would come out on top and survive 
uh, is what, you know, for me defines soul. Great example and a great definition. I've never heard of that experiment. And uh, that's, that's very consistent with so many of the other conversations we've had here on I Share Hope. If you, if you do win and you succeed and you get another chance, it really does build for the next chance and the next chance. And there's so much needed in the way of, of giving a chance and an opportunity to yourself or to others around you just to instill that hope and allow people to keep going because people are so strong and tenacious and can do so much. Question number two, who's given the most hope to you? Who's, who's delivered that hope so you can grow in your strength? I think the one person who's given me a lot of hope is my father. I, I suspect that will also be consistent across interviews. Uh, I look up to him, my dad. He's certainly given me a lot of hope. He's worked much harder than you know anyone that I know uh, and started out from basically nothing and built himself up to what he is today. And I wish and hope that I could come up to his standards and, and the way he is. And my favorite thing to say about him is that he silently taught me everything that I am and everything that I hope to be. Wow, that's wonderful. So your father is still living and there in Pakistan with you or nearby? Yes, yes. And, 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 and one of the primary reasons, he and my mom, that I came back to Pakistan. Wow, that's wonderful. It really is. And then question number three, and I don't know if this will get in there with your dad's story or just your life. But question number three, what is a, what's been a, a time in your life where you've really had to lean on your tenacious hope, that determination to continue moving forward, to, to keep going? How have you used hope in your own life to overcome adversity? Well, as far as personally I'm concerned, I, I suspect it's probably that way with most people. Life is very cyclical. Cyclical is, is probably make, making it sound predictable, but you know, cyclical in a very unpredictable way, where uh, just about every new challenge that you take up takes you to a point where you know you have to see very very dark days uh, before you could turn it around. And for me, it's consistently been that way. So I've lived many lives. I continue to live many lives where I'm a university professor. So I do research. I'm an entrepreneur. I've done little startup, and I now both run a university as its vice chancellor and and head of public sector IT projects for the government in Pakistan. And in all these lives, uh, you know, because each one of these were new challenges when I started this sort of a different life, and maybe there are these four lives that are running in parallel, each one, you know, takes you to really, really dark days where, you know, your startup idea, you spend many months trying to raise money, building a team, building a product, and someone else comes up with something much better, and months of effort just goes down the drain. And then you try it one more time and try it one more time and it's about to work out. Your team, your co-founders leave you. When it's about to work out, you know, your investor pulls out. Likewise, in government, you know, there are things that you want to do and you come, they come this close and the government changes or someone, you know, someone key decision maker that you're working with, you know, goes away, etc. So there are lots of times when you really, you know, think that you, know, you can't keep it together anymore and can't keep going. Uh, but over time, I think one thing that one develops, and that I think is a sort of almost interchangeable with hope, is faith. Uh, where you kind of develop, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's just by going through these uh, really dark periods and down times, is this faith that eventually all these dots will connect. And, and all the effort that you're making and all the dues that you're paying to accomplish something will come through. So if one door closes, another door will open up. But somehow, you know, in, in, in hindsight, these things will work out. And I'm not very old. I'm, I'm in my mid-30s. I've certainly convinced myself of this uh, self-belief, of this faith, uh, that if I keep at it, uh, eventually things will work out. And so far, they almost always have. You're right. Uh, you're You're right in that Many people seem to say the same type thing. If you keep going, just keep going, getting past that dark day, whatever is it in your life, if it's an illness, if it's um, a period of depression, if it's a business or a governmental issue, incar incarceration, addiction, we have so many stories, but so many people continue to say, you have to move forward, keep moving forward, because you'll catch it sooner or later, you'll catch on. 
you'll get it. You'll make the next step. You'll make the right connection, whatever the genre is. Great, great advice. So question number four then, how are you using hope today? So how are you building that into your own life or in the lives of others around you? Well, I think just the fact that, uh, you know, you, you develop this faith that things eventually will work out if you do all the right things, that you have honesty of purpose, you are paying your dues, working hard, and you're making sure that, you know, you never do anything that might hurt or harm other people. Uh, so it, it, you're doing all the right things and that things will work out. Once you develop this, uh, 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 you know, this faith, uh, then it's also easy to share that faith with a lot of conviction, which I do with all the young entrepreneurs that I work with. I run a very large startup incubator here where you get people to come in with ideas, wanting to build interesting products and companies. And I think the, the number one task that I have is to evangelize hope, is to sell them so this faith, this self-belief that if they keep at it and do all the right things, they will one day succeed in life. And I think once an entrepreneur, a professional, a uh, university student internalizes this message of hope, you know, then most of your work is already done. Then it's just a matter of time before, you know, it, 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 they, they, they get their big, big breakthrough. So I actually rely on this, and, and I think a large part of my day is spent in evangelizing hope, in spreading this faith that if you're doing all the right things, uh, you know, you will get somewhere. And I think once someone internalizes it, uh, that's half the battle. Great points. And leading into question number five then, so what are some simple steps? If I'm one of your students, how are you going to tell me to continue building that hope? Are there two or three simple steps that I should keep repeating and going back to to make sure that I don't get lost in the weeds but actually stay on the track and and keep pursuing my goal or my my need to change whatever in life? Well, I, I don't know how to answer that. What, one thing that I, you know I, I helps me uh, is my own uh, a credible story that I uh, tell people who work with me that see, you know, this is working hard for me, so please keep faith. Also to inspire them with examples of other successful people, people who've gone through very dark times in life and come out and have subsequently gone on to do very well, especially people doing IT startups where the success rate is literally 2%. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that really needs to hit home. Uh, but I think also statistically, if people are doing the right things, they do keep getting this positive reinforcement every so often. So I think in some ways, you know, sort of you have this faith and leave it to higher forces to guide you and to keep you on a straight and narrow by rewarding you every so often and showing you the light so that you don't get lost in the woods. Great point. Great point. I love the message of keep moving forward. And, and it really does. You keep finding those opportunities where you get that positive reinforcement and you do continue seeing a new way. And, and in really, you know, there's so many, so many times where in my life, it sounds like in your life and in other people we were talking to, you might have never seen the way to achieve or accomplish or succeed at something if you hadn't gone through the really dark period. And, and that continuing to come back and trying again, even if it's 10 times later or 100 times later, when you finally see that moment, that's when the breakthrough happens not just in entrepreneurship but in whatever situation you're coming through in life that's really great advice thank you well sir you've been tremendous if there's is there anything else that you say you know we really should understand this about hope or this about how you've succeeded in life is there anything else you'd want to leave us with a, a last nugget of truth so I think, one, I, I, I want to applaud this effort, that uh, this effort of spreading hope. Those things, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, seems odd in the sense that no one's doing it and seems like such an obvious and a simple thing to do. But I'm glad that someone is. And in a country like Pakistan where, you know, there's a security situation, there's a lot of, this is a very young country, about 60% of the population in Pakistan is below the age of 30. And so therefore lots of young people, you know, really struggling to figure out uh, what they are and, and what this country is about and about religion and extremism and where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world and, you know, just the economic challenges and the challenges of a developing world that a lot of people in this country are going through. This message of hope 
hope should resonate well with such people. And we need a lot of hope and ample amounts of this hope, especially in a country like Pakistan. I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're on the side of hope. I really am. Thank you, Chris. It, it, was, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Sir, it's been a privilege to talk to you. Thank you for your time. I will uh, I'll reach out to you. And if people want to hear more about you or follow you on social media or websites, how do they stay in touch with you and follow your progress? Well, my, my Twitter account, my Twitter handle is Umar Saf. Uh, so people wanting to follow me can follow me on Twitter. So the Twitter handle is at sign and then U-M-A-R-S-A-I-F. Umar Saf. Yes. Excellent, sir. We'll put that in the show notes and we'll look forward to sharing this story of hope. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at isharehope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next time. I went to Harvard for a very short course, uh, and I'm I'm hesitant to even call myself an alum of Harvard, but I was there for about 10 odd days for a course on global policy, which was an extortionately expensive summer. I worked at MIT for a good four years, and before that I did my grad school at University of Cambridge in England. Wow. Wow. That's impressive. And then you're really involved in Pakistan. So you're in Pakistan now. Where are you at in Pakistan? I live in Lahore, uh, which is uh, a, a sort of a very historic, a traditional city uh, in Pakistan. It's also one of the largest. It's the capital uh, of the province of Punjab. Punjab is the largest province in Pakistan. About 60% of the people in Pakistan live in Punjab. Uh, and if Punjab was a country, which is this province, it would be the ninth largest in the world by population. Really? Wow. And, and as you know, Pakistan is the sixth most populous country in the world. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So, Umar, you're, you're known for a computer scientist, for being a computer scientist and an entrepreneur. And you need to explain this because I don't understand this, and maybe I won't even have to explain it. I wouldn't be surprised at that. But... Well, my definition of hope is uh, tied to perseverance. So if someone's willing to persevere in the face of adversity, he's basically driven by this force that we call hope. This ability to persevere with the hope that you would come out on top and survive uh, is what, you know, for me defines hope. My name is Umar Saab and I share hope all the way from Pakistan. Welcome to I Share Hope the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. You're known for your work using ICT. Explain what that means. So ICT stands for Information and Communication Technology. That's basically Internet and Computers. Uh, And uh, uh, so, you know, most of the time that I, you know, in the last few years I spent uh, trying to solve uh, uh, local problems of Pakistan and in general the developing world uh, using uh, interesting IT solutions. Uh, as it, uh, you know, sort of, as it happens, uh, most of the products, IT products that get designed, and my favorite example is that of an iPhone, uh, are designed for market. Umar Seth, you are one of the world's I would say, leading entrepreneurial thinkers and and innovators, and I've I've been involved in that space for quite a bit of time personally as an entrepreneur here in the states and as a, um, a mentor through an organization called Startco, where we do a lot of incubator work as well for startups from the states and a few from overseas. But what you're doing is way past that. So. Your education is unbelievable. I'd love to hear stories about your time 